She always, um, I guess, taught all of her children uh, to do the same, right? Because I grew up, uh, I, when I was in college, I had a younger brother, but um, it was three girls. And so she taught us that independence and to be able to um, kind of navigate and do things on your own. Um, and then additionally, almost like uh, Olivia Pope said, Eli, she, she said, you gotta be twice as good, work, you know, harder than if you gotta, you know, do better 
right, in order for you to survive. So I'd say I inherited that from my mother. I think for me it's very similar. Um, my parents were right there. <laughs> um, they, they definitely gave the support that you need working in an industry like television or film. It can be very hard, so they gave me that foundation. But also, my mom is a writer, and I think she knew I was a writer before I knew I was a writer. Um, and I moved out to LA, and you know, I was an assistant, and I did that whole comedy assistant ranks thing that you do when you move to LA. And my mom was always like, what about writing? Don't you think you should write? You should try it. You should write a script, write some samples. So like, she really poured into me in that way and I think gave me the confidence to pursue writing. And here I am. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. Thank you, Mom. Yeah, I love that all of our stories feel a little similar. Uh, for me, I, I had a beautiful black woman supporting me the whole way. My mom being primarily uh, the first one who is a trailblazer. I'm a CODA for people who don't know, which is a child of deaf adults. Um, my mother was being one of the only people who were deaf in the Cayman Islands. She was a lot of firsts. Um, first person to get a driver's license first person to work as a bookkeeper, an accountant in, in her industry. And so um, there were a lot of things that she was doing that that was a lot of her. So her kind of trailblazing and persevering and showing me what that looks like, I think was, was really paramount. And then as far as just being in this industry, uh, I grew up not really seeing a lot of Caymanians doing what it is that I do. So I didn't really think that it was a possibility. I just knew that I loved theater, I loved drama, I loved acting. Never did it cross my mind to actually pursue this as a profession. I thought, well, maybe I could study it and then come back home and teach it in the Cayman Islands. But I had a beautiful professor by the name of Fanny Green Lemons who saw something special in me in undergrad and basically told me that I could do this thing and encouraged me to go and get my master's degree and encouraged me to, to do this professionally. And so sometimes it's just proof that when other people can really see you for who you are, even when you can't see yourself, they can give you that permission that you are lacking in your own self to tell you that you could really do it. So to see myself through her eyes was also something very special. I love that. Yeah. So what seems also familiar to me is that everybody has a real strong sense of who they are, um, which is an important part of being able to tell a story. Everyone here is a writer. How important is it um, that we are the people telling our stories. We know us. I need a second to think about that. But well, for me, I I know that I didn't know that I had a strong sense of self until I fully integrated into society at large. So I grew up in Gary, Indiana. It's ninety nine point nine percent black. I went to an HBCU in Memphis. We were all black. 21 is when I went out into the world and met everybody else. <laughs> and that's when I noticed the limitations. That's when I was introduced to limitations. That's when I was introduced to no. That's when I was introduced to a lot of questions. And so I am so thankful for my background because I was raised to never question myself or to never second guess myself. And I was always in communities of people that supported me. And so that was my expectation. And so I, that's how I moved through the world. So when I discovered that there were just so many other people, cultures that you know I shared this world with, then I was like, okay, well, how are we gonna collaborate if I feel this resistance? And I've never questioned myself. So I'm, I'm really thankful that that was my foundation of being with people that always supported me. So in certain situations where I was supposed to doubt myself, I didn't do that, and sometimes that would either lead to contention in a relationship or a collaboration that was alive that's supposed to happen. Yeah, to that point, you are kind of the seasoning in whatever you're in. The character that everybody knows you by, uh, Corporate Aaron, kind of plays both sides of what is expected of a person of color and you know, fitting into a corporate situation. I've had a couple of conversations with filmmakers over the years. Is there such a thing as black film still? Or are you a black comedian? Are you a black, do you know, or what do, what do you all's feelings on that? 
Well, I, I don't want to take up too much space, but I will say this. I majored in music, and we had this one class that was called African American Music. And on the first day, the professor said, American music is African American music is American music is African American music. And so that's how I feel about creativity in general, which is why it's important for us to tell our stories. I was connected with somebody here. You'd be surprised you give somebody a script with the word ashy in it and they don't know what that means. <laughs> that right there is enough for me to be like, I am not giving this to you. You're not going to do it justice. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bar. Do you know what I am? I just wanted to quickly just piggyback off of what you were saying too, because instantly what came to my mind, especially with your original question, is that as black people, we are neither monochromatic nor are we monolithic, right? So because of that, because of we, we just span the gamut of things, that's why I feel like, that's one of the reasons why I feel it's particularly important for us to tell our stories, right? Because as a black person, we all don't have the same exact experience, yet we've all experienced a lot of similar things, right? And so I feel like if we, if we are able to get on the podium, if we are able to get behind the camera, get in front of the camera, write those stories, we are able to share much more of our experiences in a way that brings us together as a community so that we can see ourselves, so that we are represented, so that we can continue to tell our stories and feel empowered to do so. So I, I just kind of wanted to kind of piggyback on that a little bit too. I, I think that's important to say. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with everything that's been stated. It's funny, I actually, I just met with a young black female author, you know, I'm reading her book, thinking about developing it as a series, and something she told me that she was faced with when going to different publishers with this book is, the lead of the book is a young 17-year-old black girl, and she's with a wealthy family, she's been adopted. And none of the publishers could understand that there are young black wealthy people who just have money and the story doesn't have to be about, oh, we're black with money. That's, that has nothing to do with what the book is about. It's just the foundation of the story. And she was met with such contention about creating that as a standard for her characters in the book. And we talked about things like this, like this is why it's important for us to tell our stories because there are young wealthy black people exactly. living that experience. It doesn't have to be trauma porn and violence and drugs and guns and you know jail and all that kind of stuff you know there are other stories that we have so and, and if i may i want to piggyback on that just the real life application to it not only must we tell our stories but we need our stories to be told because as a young black girl growing up outside of new orleans while new orleans is a predominantly black city i didn't grow up seeing black doctors and black lawyers. My dad drove a garbage truck, right? And so um, we were poor, right? <laughs> on the weekend as a pastime, we would actually get in the car and go drive through some of the neighborhoods. That was his route. And he'd be able to point out that that's a doctor that lives here. That's a, you know, a lawyer that lives there. And of course, all of these people were white. It wasn't until I went to Atlanta for the first time Right from a friend, I went to Florida and in University, I had a girlfriend. All right. <laughs> um, I had a girlfriend that lived in a community, if you know Atlanta, called Water's Edge. And it was my first time. I used to dream about being the first person to create an all black neighborhood with you know really nice homes. I went to Atlanta and lost my mind. <laughs> it happens in Atlanta. It happens in Atlanta. But think about that as a child growing up. I hadn't seen anything that told me that that actually already existed. It wasn't until I went to FAM that I realized that there were black people in Daytona because I had only seen maybe Baywatch or something and they never showed black people. So not only is it important that we're telling our stories, but again, I just want to emphasize that our stories need to be told. Agreed. And on that note, you guys really have um, taken advantage of the new media of uh, streaming outlets of social media. Talk about being able to utilize those new tools because those didn't exist. I mean, even back when Empire was out, we didn't have the access that we do now. So I'm 38 years old, I know, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I remember. <laughs> Remember very much a world where this was done with 
about any of this. And in college, at the time, Facebook was the only thing, and schools were waiting to be added. Mm -hmm. And I went to a black school, so Mark added my school last. So we were last to get, you know, Facebook. And so that was, say, you know, what, 2007 or something like that? Oh, snap. It wasn't until 2011 when I started working professionally that I started to utilize the internet as a part of my thing. So I would do a theater show, but I had my website to be like, look at me starting this theater show. My sister is seven years older than me, and she majored in mass communications. She went to college when she was 16. I was nosy. So at nine, I would look at her mass communications books. And that's when I learned the concept of mass media and social media is just a subsect of that. So I look at the internet and the digital landscape as a completely whole different span of a world. And social media is just a small part of that. So how I utilize it is outside of building, you know, social media platforms, I get real nerdy about the back end of everything that I do digitally to maximize whatever it is. So I'm gonna give just a small example to bring it down to a subset, which is social media. You know how they say, if you make the reel on TikTok, it does better than if you make the video on your phone and then put it on TikTok and then put it on this and then put it on that. I take time to maximize each platform, but across the entire internet. And one thing that I've noticed is a lot of people are very social media focused when the internet is a whole place. I found out I was trying to prove uh, to networks at the time that I had more eyeballs than them. And I had did a Sprout social media report. I have about 600,000 followers, which is a lot. But it wasn't until I did that report scanning the whole internet is how I found out that I was reaching 150 million eyeballs. So I, zoom, I use social media to infiltrate the entire internet to bring me real world success. So I use the internet to introduce people to things that are happening outside, to buy tickets to my shows, to buy my products. I make, I use the internet to still bring it to the real world to make it physical because the internet can go away. Black Planet. Take Black Planet. I, I try to revive Black Planet. <laughs> I was like, y'all, come on, let's all go to Black Planet. None of y'all came with it. <laughs> oh, it was me. You're the one? This was Mark. Okay. <laughs> she was my Mark. Chris, how has, um, in front of the camera, how has streaming and social media changed the opportunities that you have? Oh, yeah. Um, well, that one was a little tricky because it really happened, it really blew up for the most part during COVID, right? So none of us could do that communal thing where we would go to the theaters and, and watch it together and, and all of that. And so it was about bringing it to you. Um, I still feel like this one is a difficult one to navigate because as everyone knows, like the actors just went on strike because a lot of this can get a little out of hand. I, I think it's not just about bringing the media to you and being able to consume the media, but it's also about uh, remembering that there are artists that make a living doing this. And so sometimes uh, the streaming platform is really awesome because you don't really have to go everywhere in order to get that thing. Harlem is a perfect example of that. It's on Amazon Prime, we love it. I think that where it gets difficult to sustain sometimes is when you know, you're not getting residuals for every time, you know, that thing is playing or something gets bought out or even something like the blackening, right? Where it's like, you know, you, I, I, I think it was Lionsgate and I can't remember which streaming was fighting over that. I think it was Netflix. I think it was Netflix and Lionsgate that were kind of fighting over that. And it was kind of a good thing that Lionsgate won that uh, deal because then we were able to be out in theaters and I think that that really maximized on the word of mouth around the project and I think that that really included, I, I think that that helped to catalyze the success of the Black and A. Um, I feel like sometimes when things are just on streaming, it can kind of get lost in the sauce a little bit and as artists that's not exactly what we want. So it's a bit of a catch-22 sometimes and I think 
since it's fairly new, it's only a few years old for the most part, that it really burst into some type of like huge, um, you know, mountain. I think that we're still kind of navigating that as artists. So it's about kind of really seeing how do we want to uh, have our projects be seen, but then how do we want to have a sustainable career as artists as well, right? Um, so I think that's still in the making. Is it different for the Kendra Kendra? I mean, writers have a very similar situation as the actors in terms of like residuals and how we're being paid for streaming, you know. We're, we're not getting the same pay that we'd be getting if something went into syndication because it's on ABC and they're playing it on Lifetime all day. Like, it doesn't work like that when it goes to Netflix or Hulu. Right. Um, now, the flip is you look at a show like Suits, right? Who, like, they've completely blown up again now right. that it's on Netflix. So, like, streaming does come with major benefits. And then from the social media perspective, I mean, I work on a show like Power. Power wouldn't be power without social media. Like, it's like Scandal. Scandal wouldn't have been Scandal without Black Twitter. So like those things can be extremely helpful for us as artists to get eyeballs on our show, but I think we're still feeling, you know, we're still figuring out how to navigate those things and like you said, be sustainable as artists. And can I just say really quickly, I'm so sorry to, to jump in, but I, I just wanted to piggyback on this too and say this is why it's so important as Black people for us to see our own work because because I'm telling you, uh, pieces of work, white work, pe people who are not of color work, that's getting supported. Yeah. That's getting the money. And, and there's this narrative that we're trying to dispel as people of color that says, like, what do you mean we don't sell overseas? What do you mean that our, our works don't sell, that there's not an audience? And Black Panther will tell you that. The Black man will tell you that. Power will tell you that, right? And so I think it's deeply important for us as black people to support other black work so that we, we are continuing to tell the narrative to big Hollywood that says like, look, like not only do we have a place here, we are the wheels that turn this thing, right? And so I think that that's really, really important too when it comes to all aspects of that creation as a black artist. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, and when you said that, I don't know how much you guys know, but we've been fighting that battle as far as global, right, appeal for a long, long time. And kind of to your point, and we won't get into the debate here on what's a black film, but you see something like Bad Boys that just had the largest grossing um, film debut in, I think, Abu Dhabi or something like that. And to me, that's a black film because you have those two black leads. And so that dispels the myth, right? That there's not an appetite for us globally. Um, I think uh, it's interesting. I read something today that said Tubi has, I think, tripled their uh, uh, streamers, their subscribers um, in the last four years. And now they're rivaling Disney Plus and have exceeded Peacock as well as um, uh, two others, I can't remember offhand, but that just lets you know what the appetite is. And everybody thought that Tubi was a dog, you know, right. they laughed at it. <laughs> but there is an appetite and now they're going and, you know, kind of creating their own work as well. I think for me and my perspective with the two shows that I talked about, um, The Shop, which is a talk show that started out originally on HBO, that um, I think I think at the end of uh, season five, I joined last year in season six, they made the decision to actually go to YouTube. And so what that did was actually brought us to a larger audience, right? Because then you can, you know, kind of reach more people uh, and they haven't had to pay for, you know, the cable subscription service or what have you. Um, and then additionally, the other show that I have, Receipts, which is a Walmart branded game show, it is on Revolt, right? So Revolt still has linear, they still have a television program, but then they have their digital and YouTube. And so we air on both, and I'm pretty sure that we have more views on YouTube than we do even on the television network. And so that just lets you know, again, just reiterating what the power of the internet is. Um, well, we're speaking to you. You got your big first break with a film festival. Fantastic, yeah. Talk about how important film festivals are. It, I think, will give you that confidence, what we talked about early on, right? Um, and it gives you, uh, I guess, the validation that you need for your project, and particularly when you're talking about a short film. 
because there's still, I guess, not a lot of, um, you know, kind of platforms. For me at the time, though, uh, with, with my film, it won a short, um, short film award, best short film, and then it also uh, went and um, appeared in others, but then it got picked up by BET because at the time, they did have a televised program where they were actually putting the spotlight on short films. And so that did a lot just to seal um, and, and to give me the credibility that I needed then to then go out there and you know buy for more opportunities to get more work to say that okay I have this credit to my name that um, we won that short film festival award and so you know I, it's been a long time since I've uh, you know kind of been in that space but it definitely catapulted me um, you know again by virtue of them being able to have it um, air on television too. You were telling me uh, back there that you were happy to be here early because it gave you the opportunity to network, which is something very specific to the festival. Yeah. I'm one of those people where if something is happening at four, I'll roll up at 3.55. And when people are like, your call time is noon, I'm like, calm down. <laughs> this, not just any film festival, in particular, XL Film Fest is the only event that I am okay with being here as early as they want me to be because my, my movie might be in this room. My show is in this room. My producer is in this room. My next graphic designer is in this room. My camera operator is in this room. And when I think about, you know, while a lot of us feel like we're in limbo waiting for projects to get jumped up off the ground, you know, if I could just mesh a bunch of facts together all at once. Black people, we have already been told that we have trillions in spending power. We already see how we impact the globe, fashion-wise, swag-wise, everything wise. The sauce is us. It's us. So that means it's us. It is us. So that was why me finding my numbers and my true audience and eyeballs was so important to me because I got I got tired of hearing so many no's. I was like, but I have the numbers, I have the talent, I have the oh, you just don't want me here. And I think sometimes we need to deal with the reality that sometimes they just don't want us there. And so that's a hard you know, thing to happen. But if we wanted to cancel this panel right now and make a movie, we could. And I think the lit, the, I don't, I don't network up, I do it across. And my next partnerships in this room, like this is, this is lit, this is where it's set. You don't know who you sit next to, for real, for real. For real, for real. Grace, you flew in just for this. I did. <laughs> I did, I did, and, and I, I want to again jump on what Lisa's saying. I think, I think the bigger picture in Hollywood that is constantly pervade to us is that formulaic structures are the things that make the money. What I'm waiting for people to get, get is that innovative structures is what make the money. Right? And I think when it comes to film festivals, that is where the innovation lies. Right? So Moonlight was an indie. The Holdovers was an indie. There, there are so many indies that have blown up through the way of film festivals that, like, if, 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 if the, the money makers, if the, the green lighters, you know, if, if the people in Hollywood really were to take the chance and say, like, really, it is, it is not the formula, it was the fact that it was unique and no one had ever done it. And that is why, up until now, we will forever stand behind the color purple. Like, this is why, you know, the Alice Walkers of the world, right? Like, we truly, we truly, the gift is in us, the answer is in us, the money is in us, the opportunities are in us, the business is in us. My husband and I say this all the time. There is absolutely no business without the show. But there can be a show without the business. Yes, say that again. <laughs> and so it's like they need us. They need us. And so that's one thing that I really, really do love about the film festivals is that there is an opening that says if it's new and we haven't seen it, in fact, it's even more attractive to us if we haven't seen it. And it is a true way in for us as artists, writers, people behind the camera, people in front of the camera to truly get our foot in there and to try to get something to be seen to eventually get to the point where we're the ones that green light stuff. Yes. Yeah. Because sometimes it's scary that getting your foot in the door means making the thing. That's it. I want to I speak to that too. So I had a web series that I produced in ABFF 
Fest, it premiered there, we went to New York. I think we were in like six or seven festivals. And I really believe that my participation in that web series helped me get in those staffing rooms and helped me get my first job on Designated Survivor. The fact that I was able to go into those meetings and say, hey, I took personal money and invested in, in this thing, and my friend and I made this thing, and we took it all over the country to these different festivals. That was impressive to the people in the room because most people talk about it and don't actually do it. Right. So I think there's so much power in making your own content. And I think we have to keep doing that and utilize it. Like it's for networking, it's for meeting the people that you're gonna work with next, it's for getting those staffing jobs, it's for getting your next role. Like you never know what's gonna come from that. I, I want to add one thing because I forgot when you asked the question, I was thinking about my project. I love what you said about the networking. Um, this is something that just happened within the last month for me. I went to ABFF many, many, many years ago, guys. And I wasn't even, I was still working uh, in telecom at the time, but I knew what I wanted to do, right? And so some girlfriends and I, we all went down to ABFF and there was a, uh, a director whose feature film had premiered. She actually wound up winning Best uh, Feature that year, but then she also printed up her script and created books, and she was selling them for maybe about $20. And so I hadn't, uh, I think, written my first script yet, and so I wanted to buy that, not only to support her, but then also to, you know, kind of see, okay, how's this thing done, right? Um, I'm gonna tell you guys my age because I want you to know the impact of this. It was almost 20 years ago that this happened. was trying to set up um, an, an interview with me out in LA when I was gonna be out there doing some work. Had a conversation with the writer. The writer said, oh, do you know this person? This is a, a, a black female, now, TV and film director. And I said, and this was the third time someone has asked me about her in the last week. And I said, you know what? I don't know her, but I know of her. That writer connected us via email. I told that director, my story from 20 years ago and that when I had met her, I still had her book. I took pictures and emailed that to her. She was so moved that she says, I wanted to meet with you and we made it happen. She was just coming back from a trip from Japan and now she has now taken me under her wing. So never get too big to where you think you can't have a mentor either, right? Because she's in a space where, you know, she's on the scripted side and I want to get into that space. I'm on the hybrid, unscripted side. And we met for over two hours and she was dropping gems. But I know that that was the power of me being able to tell her that I had met her 20 years ago. And this is that full circle moment. And so again, just like Lisa said, the connections are in the room and the people that you're gonna be able to do work with in the future. All right, so as we wrap up, and thank you for your time in advance, but as we wrap up, we know what you all have done. Let's put out there what you're gonna do. Let's, what's, what are your anticipated successes? Let's put it in the universe. Goodness, well, uh, right now I will say that uh, my husband is writing and we're gonna be producing some things together because we're so passionate about creating that content. Um, what's already in the universe right now is that, um, like I said, Harlem, we just wrote, we just wrapped that. And I'm actually writing a third children's book. So I write children's books. Um, I have a third. That's some children's books. Oh, Thank right. you. <laughs> that is good, that is good. So I have a third one uh, coming out that, that our son actually inspired. So Ooh. I'm really excited about that one coming out because again, right, black stories, our stories, stories of color, like from when you're young, like I'm really all about that. So writing that right now. Um, yeah, and just trying to get into the creative front a little bit too, right? So uh, right now, the majority of my experience is in front of the camera, but you know, trying to get behind the camera a little bit too. Um, for me, so as I mentioned, season three of Forest will be coming soon, and I think, <laughs> 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 Bones. Um, I also,
also am developing a series with Peacock, so hopefully you'll be seeing that soon. I'm developing another series with Stars, hopefully you'll be seeing that soon. Um, and I'll be the showrunner of both of those things. <laughs> other people's stuff. I, I would like to build my own production company where I can produce my own shows, but also produce other people's work. I don't, I don't want to have to write the rest of my life, to be honest. I'd like to pour into other people and find other young artists to work with. Um, one of my frequent collaborators is here, John Conley. Um, we have a, a short film coming out soon that's going to premiere at the Chicago International Film Festival. So we're excited about that. My fiance who's there, he also was one of the executive producers on that. So just trying to, you know, make the little empire. Yeah. <laughs> it just shines down on you. Um for me, uh, we are out of our main season of the shop, um, but we just shot at the Olympics in Paris and um, Let's go. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was gonna air at the end of this month. Um, and then we just kicked off season two of Receipts. Like I said, that that's on Revolt. We got a whole new host, whole new um, platform. Um, one of the blessings in it is that last year we were limited to only 12 minutes of content and uh, the brand loved it so much. The numbers were so good that they increased it to a full half hour show. And so that's really exciting for us. Um, and so you guys can check that out either on Revolt or on, uh, on YouTube. Lala Malala is our host this season. Um, and then for me, um, I've done a bunch of things, um, and so I, I have a full slate that's kind of projects that have been in the back burner for a long time. Um, but the one that I'm in production uh, with right now is a, a docu-series called Disciple. That's all about elevating and celebrating men who unabashedly love God out loud. So I'm super, super excited. Well, I am having a lot of fun controlling my own universe, and I am going to uh, keep doing that. So I, in the real world, I have a live monthly show in Chicago at Laugh Factory. It's every first Monday, yes, it's every first Monday, uh, except for July and September, because those are holidays. So I plan to be there until they kick me out the building. I just got news that this is the longest running show at the Laugh Factory. Yeah. 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 Uh, if you have an all access pass, you can come to the show that I'm doing Sunday night at the Laugh Factory at 9 p.m. Pull up, your ticket is secured. Uh, beyond that, so I'm planning my 2025 right now. And so what that looks like for me is adding more monthly shows because that contributes to uh, my bottom line as a business to be able to do this. And so my strategy is, I am hoping to connect with some camera operators so I can stop holding my phone and start doing more high quality content. <laughs> so I'll be reaching out to you for high quality content. Yeah! Yeah, 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 no, but for real. So like, you got a camera, I need that high quality content. And, and, then what, and then what we'll do is then we're gonna start pitching to her because she's ready. So that's how that goes. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna start doing <laughs> If you're familiar with my characters, they're gonna start interacting with each other um, in high quality content. And <laughs> well, we keep saying that. And um, yeah, I have dreams. I wanna I wanna put all my characters in one movie. Um, there will be a corporate Aaron show. Yeah. And, yes, I'm gonna do it myself. Um, what else is coming up? Oh, oh, I'm also excited about how I'm doing it. So to get around a whole resources thing, my model is this. I find businesses and small businesses and individuals who have money to sponsor or invest in real world things that I'm doing and I pour that money into my content. This is how I get around wait for somebody to give me money to make something. I just make it myself on a business tip. So for anybody that's like, where is the money gonna come from? You know, old school, we used to just do like sponsorships and like roll up to a business and be like, will you sponsor my video? And they will. So um, this year I'm, um, I'm just playing around, having more fun playing, and I'm doing different cities and everything, and using all of this data to present to people for viable business options where if you don't like my talent, you like these numbers, right? So just exhausting all of those options as a creator. Yeah. Yeah. Well,
playoff music. Yeah. Thank you to Troy for having us all here today. Thank you so much for sharing this conversation with us. And let's get to network. Make some noise for these ladies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to go to the nursery and knowledge of them right now. A black woman just spoke to everybody.